My name is Seth Rudetsky, here's my background if you care. I saw my first Broadway show when I was four and it was hair. Ever since then I've made Broadway my life. It's my joy and my muse, my mistress and my wife. Now, before you say you're white, you have no right to rapture. I say Robert Preston did it in the Music Man, so work. Look, what do you talk? What do you talk? What do you talk? My problem is I overbook myself, you see, you see? I schedule too much, I've got adult ADD. I host on Broadway radio, write books and play piano. I tour the country doing shows from Maine to Indiana. So watch me as I DJ, write, or play for some diva. By the end, you'll love Broadway. And you'll have your death fever. The book that I wrote, my awesome, awful popularity plan, is now out. And I'm doing my book release at Barnes & Noble. And what makes it even swankier, it's the Upper East Side. There are a lot of manuscripts I get where the author does not sound like himself, and this one is completely authentic. Justin is an overweight high school sophomore who is so low on the popularity scale, he's below the kid who always carries his tuba around. And he just comes up with this brilliant plan to gain popularity and therefore become the heartthrob of the school quarterback. And his best friend Spencer tries to talk reason into him and Justin is having none of it. It's really fun. The reviews have been so praising the fact that it's so authentic and it's so perfect for the teen voice and it's so appropriate for that level. So it's very exciting. We became obsessed with his videos on YouTube in Canada. When we were at theater school? Yeah. And then um, we just came here to watch some shows this week and we found out that he was doing a signing and we were like, jumped on it like yeah. so fast. Barnes & Noble buys a lot of books and then your purpose is to get those books sold. So I'm trying to sort of promote how great this book is by doing a live reading and then hopefully after I do this live reading, there are all these people lined up yeah. buying books, which I will then autograph, which will make it skyrocket in value. Secondly, I made copies the last minute, haven't numbered them, nor have I put them in a notebook. Can't believe I was unprepared. Didn't I watch my own episode one of my reality show? Didn't I know I'm irresponsible? I'm an idiot. The amazing news is that they also set up a big interview for me with New York One, which I'm very excited about. We open six thirty. We open the doors, so we can maybe do it in the green room. Go hang out yeah. in the green room. First devastating part is look at my hairstyle. It's a combination of greasy and flat. Uh, okay. So tell me about your book first and foremost. I have written my first young adult novel, What I Have It On Me, Random House, and it's about a fifteen-year-old. Uh, fat Jewish kid with a Jufro, or as B.B. Neuwirth calls it, an Isro. Then, of course, I, I sassed her with some amazing comedy jokes. <laughs> Literally nary a laugh out of the person interviewing me. Never seen a blanker face. And he decides he's gonna become popular and dates the football player, and he has a whole plan, and shockingly it backfires. It's very, it's very I Love Lucy, just a lot of ruses that all backfire. Let me just say, there's a really cute football player, and a girl he pretends to date, and a Jufro, and love handles. And that's the book. Did you use any What's... life experiences? I would say it's based on being an incredibly unpopular person in school. Not just high school, I'm talking about elementary school, junior high school, high school, quite frankly, college. And actually, you know what? Now. Anyway, it's based on me. So why write a book targeted at teenagers? I constantly read young adult books. I love them. And I have to say, there are not very many that are funny. They're, I love them, though, but they're not very many that are funny. So I decided to combine my worlds, young adult book and comedy. The good news about having my mom live so nearby on Long Island is that she comes to all my events. What's great is that she's always calling my sister, but she's really careful to keep her voice at a very appropriate level for being indoors. Yes, my mother comes to all my stuff. It always has to come 45 minutes early. Okay. Actually. Why don't you listen? You could listen. Uh, is that Kavanaugh? Hey, hon, how you doing? So I picked some of my Broadway pals to come join me for this reading. I have cutie, cutie, sexy pot, Matt Kavanaugh. You mean glasses? I am a glasses. I've never seen that before. Age. I know, what's up with that? It gets all of us. I'm gonna have my Broadway star friends read characters from the book, but on top of that, I'm gonna have them also perform numbers. You know this whole character that I play is obsessed with a football player, so I thought maybe your song could be my dream, so instead of Maria, would you um, sing it to um, Justin Goldblatt? So then I decided, what if the character Justin Goldblatt has as a fantasy that Chuck, the football player, is singing a love song to him? Justin Goldblatt, Justin Goldblatt, and I go, and cut. Okay, So good. that'd be the first thing. Okay, cool. Okay. Cool, that works. 
Justin Goldblatt. Hopefully that'll get a laugh. That's his name. Justin Goldblatt, Justin Goldblatt, Justin Goldblatt. It's music to my ears. Then I have Rory O'Malley, who's starring in the Book of Mormon as my best friend, Spencer. Be a little bit more relaxed, but yeah. I, I like it fast, but it can be a little more relaxed. By the way, one of the next ones. Let me spray some on your hand. Rory O'Malley had just done this big star-studded benefit of She Loves Me, so I asked him to sing a song, Try Me, from She Loves Me. The only problem is, it has this really difficult piano passage where you have to play six. A six means that it's six notes apart. Bum, bum. And it goes really fast, so you don't, you're not playing like da 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 You're just kind of putting your finger in the sixth position and then going gunk, 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 and you have to kind of keep it in the same position. Anyway, I was terrified playing at the rehearsal, but I essentially played it well. Listen. What? Man, it's hard to play, but they sound great. I asked my good friend Carrie Butler to come and read the part of Becky. She's on vacation this week, but she purposely moved her plane flight like a couple of hours earlier so she can get in to do the book reading. So she kept texting me being like, oh my God, my plane's not taking off. Finally, she's like, I'm not gonna make your book reading. The amazing news is my friend Andrea Burns is not doing a show right now. So I immediately called Andrea on her cell phone with like five seconds to spare, and I begged her to come do this book reading. Good news, Andrea's still on 14th Street and 7th Avenue, so I guess she's not getting here. But the event is in 45 minutes, you live in the Lower West Side. I guess we're not practicing? I think I know it. Did anyone ever bring music? Of course, Andrea was like, wait, I have five minutes to get there. What am I going to do? I'm like, Andrea, we'll haul out the song we've done before, which is always a surefire audience pleaser. Her amazing comedy version of I Feel Pretty, which I pretty much had memorized. Was it? Still got it. What about Andrea? Andrea, do you want to? She'll be here at places. <laughs> It's fine. She's waiting for uh, Peter to come and babysit Hudson. So I know her stuff. And we'll just... Wait, okay. hi, Eric. My good friend Eric Myers is also my book agent. But I was like, oh, he's going to give me flowers. He's going to give me candy. His present to me was a sheet of paper to wipe away the sweat and grease from my face. What are you waving? Yeah, this one, one of those things. Oh, uh, the, the grease? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Not, not Probably, my boyfriend once got this for a, a birthday present because of how greasy I am. I was like, it's a passive aggressive present. <laughs> flowers, candy. Grease mop mopper upper. And I stock up on those all the time. You wipe it over your face and it's it dims horrible. the shine. Eric, good when news you're... I learned about you. Thank you. Yeah, all services rendered. The exciting news is I actually have a, I have a crowd show up and it's like, it's a cold, horrible winter day and it's the east side. No, I know. It's me land right in here. <laughs> we've, been, we've been scouting an hour and a half, so. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great crowd. Yeah, good. It's horrible rain. It's signature, signature. Barnes and Noble asked me to sign some books in advance under the guise of, you know, you're famous, sign these books for us. The real subtext is, if these books don't sell, when I personally autograph them, they're just going to keep my signed copies, and then they'll be in Barnes and Noble. You know, it says autographed copy. That really means these books didn't sell. Do you mind personalizing if that comes up? Uh -huh. Okay. This, oh yeah, sure. This one. Want... Jack. <laughs> All right, I'll go make sure she get makes her way down here. Yeah, you. As long as I can call everyone Bob. <laughs> My personalizing. As long as I can call everybody Bob. It's very funny. So, how long do you think we should wait? Is everyone sitting? Um, well, we've we've. We're letting everybody in now, so. Andrea's not on until the third segment, so. Okay, so the last minute I call Andrea Burns to come fill in. But where is she? Literally, I'm gonna have to begin with myself playing the male lead role and then in full drag as the female lead role. So we'll wait, we'll hold a little bit and then, because everybody's settled. Uh, I'm not prepared, but everybody can't fuck off. Right, so you said chapter one, and then what are you doing? In chapter one, and then, and then, then you'll do Maria. I'll keep on stage. I'll... Perfect. I mean, it was. Hi, Hi Drea. Hi. Perfect. Hi. Just want to make you sweat a little bit. I'm just going to and then we're going to start, okay? Right. Thankfully, she arrives. Matt, can you yeah. show Andrea your first scene? Because I would, I would maybe have her play the mother at the end. 
right. The bottom of page nine. Oh, scene. okay. Okay, remember at the JCC where I was handing out the scripts the last second? It's episode one of my reality show, watch it. Any event I've ever done, it's just exactly the same. Just transfer the names and the, the what's actually on the sheets, but essentially last minute, passing out, no one knows what they're doing. So I hand out the scripts to everybody so they can actually read through their parts, even though it's places. So I say she couldn't bear to be the one older person sitting in the classroom with 20 year olds. I remember taking sociology with a 60 year old woman who suddenly decided to go back to school I didn't want that to be me. Everyone in the class called her Wrinkle Face. But her last name was Winkle Face. She deserved it. That's not the point. And she'd sign and with her classic line. I'll always be a college dropout. That's great. Awesome. <laughs> Why is everybody amazing at cold readings in this group? Literally, and I wrote the book and I'm like, I don't know what I'm acting here. <laughs> so I'll start on stage with me, with me. Why don't you enter as Wait, are you starting on stage with you? I'm sorry, yeah. No, me. I'm sorry. I'll start on stage with me and then yeah, actually, you, we'll both come up together because you come up so soon. Okay, okay. Yes. So we'll both come up together, and then Matt will make his appearance as the mean guy. Okay. I don't okay. have the other one, right? You have it? I have the other one for you. I was like, I'll be reading it off my phone. Devastating. <laughs> okay. They actually highlighted, I think. Shockingly, I didn't make enough copies for everybody. Can't believe I wasn't prepared. So you I'm guys tell me, uh, okay. are you ready? Or do you need a few more minutes? I think we're ready. Ready to go? Oh my God, here you guys all shut up. Thank you. Yep. Now I get to come. Welcome to Live in Barnes & Noble. Thank you for being here. Tonight, our um, performance series celebrates the launch of my awesome, awful popularity plan. What better way to celebrate a book about popularity than with the author and some of his bestest friends? Aww. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome to the awesome and popular Seth Rudetsky. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming out on a crazy, uncomfortable day. It's so wet out. Um, let me first bring out my... First friend, Roar, where are you? Hi, Hi guys. Yeah. Okay, so besides doing a book so, reading, I also decided to do interviews. So I asked Rory O'Malley, he began literally in a tiny little course part in the Book of Mormon and it crazily expanded, not unlike my gut. Stop, S stop it. Oh, ensemble, I was Elder Green, I had two lines. <clears throat> two lines. And then by and then you kept doing what the workshops or something? Yeah, we did readings and workshops, and every single one there was like another line here. And then they made me the head of the mission when they got to Uganda. And four years later, Try I'm on a stage with I'm on a stage with Seth Rudetsky. What I love is that Rory's mother uh, is from the Midwest, and it's just so foreign to her for her son to be nominated for a Tony that when he called her to say, "Mom, I was nominated for a Tony," she said. Are you sure? We better double check. <laughs> we were telling you one until we double check. Double check what? She has no idea. I was like, Matthew Broderick and Anika Noni Rose said it, Mom. It's okay. <laughs> better double check. So cute. And so Rory did this big, amazing benefit of She Loves Me, starring, it was you and my Benanti. Uh, like, no, no, Kelly O'Hara. Kelly O'Hara. Yeah, and, and Josh Radner from How I Met Your Mother and Work. Victor Garber. He played the youngin who was like, please, you know, I want a job here. I don't make the, what is that, the bus boy? I'm sort of the, 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 del the delivery boy. I'm a delivery boy, but I want to work at this perfumery. So the perfumery, he rides his bike all around town. Here comes Rory's big song from She Loves Me that I asked him to sing. And I have the scary, scary six. Remember the six? <laughs> Right at the beginning, I nail it. Going shelf by shelf, and I know every item in the store. Every tube, jar, box, bottle, carton, and container. Where they are, what they cost, what they're for. Here come the ending six. Why not try me? And I clanked. Not horrible, but I clanked. So this is chapter one. I cannot believe I'm reading this. I literally remember sitting at my computer writing this. I can't believe the book is actually out. It's, oh my God, it's amazing. This book has only been read by a couple of people. This is like my first time reading it in public. And like, I know that my editor thinks it's funny, my agent, but will anybody else, will I at least get a laugh? Or as Mr. Burns calls it on The Simpsons, a laugh? Try to figure out which boy I have the biggest crush on. Is it Quincy Slatton, the science genius, sure to win a Westinghouse scholarship? No. Is it Tally Higgins, the stoner who was always seen at school but never in class? Why should it be? There's at least a slight possibility that someday I could date one of them. Instead, I've made it as difficult as possible for myself to ever fulfill my dreams of love. Yes, I, Justin Goldblatt, the school loser, have a crush on the oldest chestnut in the book, the unattainable star quarterback, 
Chuck Jansen. Give me a nerf. How cliche is that? FYI, it's pronounced cliche. In English class today, David Chasen was reading a Guy de Maupassant story out loud, and he pronounced it cliche. <laughs> Everybody, including Mr. Fabry, laughed. Even though I felt bad for David, I joined in. It felt good to finally not be the reason the class was laughing. The first chapter is about 15-year-old Justin Goldblatt, you know, with the Jew fro. Usually, after I speak in class, Doug Gould will cough faggot into his fist. He does it in such a way that the teacher doesn't hear, but everybody else does. And his arch enemy in school who always makes fun of him is named Doug Gould. Lately, he's been using various themes depending on what the class is focusing on. We're studying pilgrims, so in social studies he'll cough, <clears throat> thou art gay, in my direction. <laughs> and since we're learning the periodic table in earth science, I've gotten used to hearing a constant chant of phagnesium whenever I speak. Yay, it is funny. To my fans. Not to the general public. On the surface, this would be a perfect problem to work out with Spencer because he's so smart. But I have to remind myself that his advice always starts out helpful and then gets annoying. <laughs> Justin's best friend is Spencer, who's very like into karma and vegan food and- I told you before, Justin, karma means that whatever you do, the same is done back to you. Totally the opposite of Justin, who's just like, now, 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 me, 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 ego, 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 ADD, based on this person right here. Spencer, listen to what I'm telling you. I like boys. I am what they say I am. I'm a fag. And Justin, I'm asking you this. You're Jewish, right? I nodded. <laughs> Does that mean you're a kike? Yes, you're called a fag and you're gay, but don't take on the negative connotations of being gay. Whereas, yes, you're Jewish, but because someone calls you a kike doesn't mean you should feel bad about being Jewish. It's sort of a deep concept for a young adult book. It was the first time I separated being gay from being called a fag. Just because we're not what the majority is doesn't mean we have to take on, a on the a-hole-like words they attach to us. Good point, I thought then. Wait a minute, he said, just because we're not what the majority is? <laughs> Spencer wasn't Jewish. <laughs> So the first time I ever saw Matt on Broadway, I wanted to, let's say I had a crush on him. Oh, I, I, I was in the big hit that ran forever called Urban Cowboy. He was in a show called Urban Cowboy. It was supposed to close, but then it stayed open, but it closed. I asked him about that. Well, we opened on Thursday. We had that dreaded meeting on Friday, and they said, well, kids, congrats. We're going to close tomorrow. Oh, show didn't get good reviews. They came on stage their final night, took a bow. Like, oh my God, it's the last time we're ever going to do the show. Producer came back on stage and he's like, we got more money, we're staying open! So he came on stage and he said, well, you know, hey, audience, thanks so much for having us. We're gonna sing some cut songs of the show for you tonight, but we're not because we're not closing. It was very 42nd Street. And then they stayed open. And, and then they closed again, <laughs> fairly quickly. You know, that's a way to get a sold out crown. Just say you're closing. Exactly. <laughs> Although it only works once, maybe twice. I don't know. Norman does it every night. Every exactly. night, Norman's closing. Like, this turkey's done. So I asked Matt to sing his big song from West Side Story as Chuck, the football player. Because I'm sure Justin Goldback, the character, went to go see West Side Story starring Matt. And I'm sure he looks almost like Chuck, the football player. I'm sure. That's and it's sort of a fantasy Justin Goldblatt is having that Chuck is going to sing a love song to him. <laughs> Let's see if the audience finds it funny or merely a desecration of a beautiful Leonard Bernstein, Stephen Sondheim song. The most beautiful song I ever heard. Justin Goldblatt. <laughs> Justin Goldblatt, Justin Goldblatt, Justin Goldblatt. All the beautiful sounds of the world in two separate words. <laughs> Justin Goldblatt, Justin Goldblatt, Justin Goldblatt, Justin Goldblatt, Justin Goldblatt, Justin Goldblatt. It's funny and a desecration. Chuck was sitting in the back of the room, and even though Becky was across from him, the seat behind him was blissfully empty. I sat down and stared at Chuck, who was at the computer directly in front of me, and Becky was next to him. Now it's chapter three, where all the plot really begins, and the chaos happens. Justin gets himself detention so he can be with Chuck, because he wants to ask Chuck out. That's his big plan. It's like, I'm gonna ask out the football player on a care if he's straight, maybe it'll work. As I sat down, I noticed that Chuck was logged onto his email. Huh, I thought, maybe an old school instant message is the way to connect with him. I typed in my screen name, Broadway Forever, at <laughs> And my password, I 
iHeart Broadway. <laughs> Becky's cell phone began to vibrate. She picked it up and whispered, hello, so Miss Horvath wouldn't hear. She murmured something, then hung up. That was Dad. His car's in the shop and he can't pick me up. Excellent. Let's go out somewhere after detention. Look, I want to see you at a normal hour. Are you crazy? He'll find out. I have to call a cab to take me right oh, home. Come on, Becky. Is this going to go on till we graduate? It has to. I heard him say to Mom when they thought I was asleep that if he had to, he'd transfer me to an all-girls school. Mm -hmm. Sounds hot. <laughs> so they were still together behind her father's back. It seemed kind of tenuous. If they broke up, then I'd have Chuck to myself. Becky's father hates Chuck, and Chuck and Becky are therefore secretly dating. But then suddenly, her father shows up. Becky! <clears throat> her dad walked up with a big smile. He was an imposing six foot three with a youthful, handsome face, but completely silver hair. Her father, by the way, is also played by Rory O'Malley. We're double cast, as we say in the business. You know that your mother and I forbade you from seeing him anymore. Chuck stepped up to her father. Hey, Dr. Phillips, we broke up last June like you wanted. All right, we just happened to have detention together today. Her father's eyes narrowed. You also just happened to be at Ben & Jerry's that night I saw both of you. And at the Gap, and at the footbridge by the lake. And Justin's like, ah, what am I gonna do? Because Becky's father's gonna transfer Becky to an all-girls school, and then Chuck will transfer, and I'll have nobody to obsess about. I know for a fact that Becky is through dating Chuck because I gave Becky an intense look, hoping she knew where I was going with this. So Justin's like, I've got to save the day. Think, think! <laughs> Your daughter is now dating me. He's in theater class with Becky, and they practice doing stage kissing. So Justin's like, maybe that's the key to how I'll solve this whole problem. I turned toward her and immediately pulled her into our stage kiss. <laughs> we held her for 10 seconds and disengaged. Becky grabbed my hand and turned towards her father. He was smiling. <laughs> Bye-bye! Rory, man, Andrea, it's so fun! The antics begin, because after that, crazaziness happens. Let me just say it backfires 55 times from Sunday. Okay, we're gonna close with one little song that I'm obsessed with, my friend Andrea. Andrea, come up. Who, as I always when I record the last minute, flat out said yes, got a babysitter. Andrea was Carrie Butler, I just feel it's Carrie Butler's understudy. That's right, and so here I am again. <laughs> So what's ironic is that Andrea also understudied Carrie Butler low those many years ago in Beauty and the Beast. She got sick, but in the middle of act one. So they had to put Andrea on, So, but they, they can't make an announcement. So it's just like, Belle left the stage, and she was like, au revoir, papa. And then one minute later, five foot eight comes on, saying, bonjour, papa. Whoa! <laughs> the audience is like, ah, that's not Belle. Who's the monster lady? I feel pretty. The good news about being friends with people from Broadway and playing for them all the time is that you know their material backwards and forwards. Uh, here's the truth. As long as people are asking, I'll be pulling that little white dress out until I'm 85. Okay, if a late stretch can do it. See a pretty girl in that mirror there. this so many times and it always works. Bye bye. Thank you. One, two, three, the fella. Hot bad, hot bad. Bye everybody, thank you so much. Very cool, thank you so much. It went great. It got a lot of larfs, which made me very happy. Who am I making this out to? Thank you. This is so exciting. People are buying this book. I can't believe it. It's so bizarre to me. My agent told me if you write a young adult book with a gay character lead, it will get published really, really quickly. Or three chapters in two weeks. My agent was like, this is great. It's so great. Finish it. Two years later, literally, 
you would not stop harassing me. And I was like, I know, I know, I should finish it. Finally, my partner was like, okay, Eric is now telling me to tell you to finish it. He literally brought James into it, and I was like, oh my God, I have to finish it. You're so nice, what's your name? Melissa. Melissa, thank you. I actually saw your concert when you were in Miami. So I'm going back there again. You don't live there, do you? No, I live here now. Just like, keep stalking you, no big deal. No, keep it up, I need people to stalk me. Sounds good. I got my radio show, and I'm always doing some benefit, and I have my chatterbox, so I sort of have a core group of fans that come out and support me, and it was delicious to see them all there. You came from Canada to see me, or you happen to be driving to New York? Actually, we, we have, well, we were, or we are, had our plans to come, but we're skipping Broadway shows so we can see you. You are? Yes. What's with the accent? Are you from Montreal? No, actually, I'm not. No, we're West, we're West Coast. We're West Coast. Wait, so nice of you to come. God bless SiriusXM and the internet, because because of that, I have fans literally like in different parts of the world. I did a flight from Venice to New York, had to stop in Frankfurt. So we're online for immigration. It's actually a little scary to be online for immigration, plus it's Germany, plus I'm Jewish. To Sarah. With an H? I hope so. Julie's like, oh, she asked me, she said, can I throw out this Coke can? And I said, oh yeah, go use the garbage over there. So she had to leave line and come back. He has this love for that movie. <laughs> Which, you're so weird. Well, one second later, the TSA security passport SS, whatever, comes out to me and like literally starts pointing to me and I'm like, so I'm like, wait, you're not allowed to throw something out when you're on a passport line? I'm literally in a panic, I can't hear what he's saying. And finally I'm like, wait, what, wait, what? And he's like, Broadway. I watch you on the internet, Broadway. I have a fan in Frankfurt that is a TSA agent that loves Broadway. Look at that, awesome debut. Musical director, writer, and serious XM radio host, Seth Rudesky celebrates the release of my awesome, awful popularity plan. His first teen novel about a theater-obsessed high schooler with help from Broadway stars, Carrie Butler, Matt Cavanaugh, and Rory O'Malley. <laughs> Carrie Butler part is a lot. I have a lot of supporters in all different um, aspects of New York. My friend Wayman Wong works for the Daily News and literally like, gives me shout outs in the Daily News. So sweet of him, Rob Wayman. You know what this is, totally, this, uh, when I read this? Marjorie. Marjorie. Oh yeah, totally based, totally based on the first show that I wrote 20 years ago when I first met Andrea. Which I saw and I was like, I have to meet this man and make him my friend because it's the funniest thing I've ever seen. That's how we became friends. She saw my show. That is totally based on Marjorie. I was like, and you're like, great, now I have a plan. I was like, oh my god, I love that Marjorie's in this book. Well, I love having Andrea here because first of all, you know, she saw that show that I wrote about Marjorie, Dialing for Marjorie. So she's been a part of my whole writing career since I first began. Second of all, when I was writing my first book called Broadway Nights, she was doing the full Monty and I was playing in the pit and I would come to her dressing room and literally bring her chapters of like just typewritten pages. So now like she's here at my actual full delicious book release of my second book. She's been with me through it all. Look at the John Hancock right here, kids. Right here. Yeah! Wow, so I got the placement. I never took a writing class or anything like that, and if anything, I think I got busted for my writing in high school. I wrote some creative writing story, and I remember Mrs. Blumenthal gave me like a C on it. He's a total. Diva. It's very cool to me that I just hyped something, and then it got printed, and now it's a book. My life goal is either to be set or to have an obsessed video made about me. You're not supposed to see this part. <laughs> got a couple of laughs. The singing was great. My friends were incredibly supportive. Fans came out, I signed a lot of books, I sold a lot of books. It was a successful day. I have to Hold on, wait. Julie, really here, take the one that I read. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, I think you'd like it. Wait, uh, what's that?